what I want to do is to explain to you briefly um, why exactly it is that landscape architecture might possibly be a mind-expanding drug. Um, now, the, uh, the, the idea that astronauts, when they're in outer space, has created something uh, that's now referred to, I believe the, the term was coined in about 1987, something called the overview effect. Now this is when astronauts in outer space gazing back at the Earth below them get a sudden sense of the interconnections of all things, about the fact that there's a certain fragility to human life and that that great blue marble that's floating beneath them is, is actually something that needs to be preserved and needs to be thought about in ecological terms, that actually we need ecological modes of thinking to connect with the earth around us and as we go into our design process as well. So as designers, we're connecting with a world that is already in motion, that is already in action, so we don't just draw a red line around the site and then design into it. There's something already going on. So um, this overview effect. Uh, here are the words of uh, a space shuttle astronaut named Tom Jones. I, 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 I love this. I can imagine him in space singing, you can leave your helmet on. Um, but uh, my, he says, my overwhelming sense was of Earth's uniqueness as a harbor for life. As a resident of this world, it's impossible not to see it now as a place both graced and threatened by mankind. Becoming a space traveler nearly inescapably makes one an advocate for careful stewardship of our environment. So this distance, like it, it's, it's remarkable to think that you might actually have to get off of the planet in order to learn how to value it. Um, but this is something I think that, uh, that, that, that landscape architects do because they bring an ecological awareness to the site. Um, so let's talk about LSD. Um, probably something you don't hear about a great deal anymore. Apparently there's a great shortage of LSD these days. Um, one of the big uh, factories that used to manufacture it in, um, in California has shut down, but essentially this is the drug that comes from uh, the ergot fungus and which is mind altering and people say mind expanding. So these are some of the images that we get that are associated with LSD. This is a film uh, from 1974, I think, Roger Corman's film, The Trip, uh, with um, uh, 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 Peter, um, ah, <laughs> Peter Fonda, and, um, and that's Dennis Hopper there, uh, all very sort of psychedelic sort of film. However, um, it's a kind of smart drug too. Uh, so this is actually, um, I don't know how many people are actually that familiar with the drug, but it used to be dropped onto blotter paper, and then you tear off a little square of it and put it on your tongue, and then spend several hours moving into hallucinogenic realms, but actually starting to feel a sense of the interconnectedness of things in the universe. So the proponents of the drug, Timothy Leary and Hoffman and such, all believed that actually it was a drug that was going to move our consciousness into a new kind of ecological realm. So this is, this is uh, Albert Hoffman, the father of LSD. Um, he was the man who isolated it. And uh, I, I love this kind of science-y picture of him. Um, but uh, he was an advocate for the drug throughout his life. Um, and this is actually an excerpt from the speech he gave on his 100th birthday. So uh, it, it's, it's at least proof that LSD doesn't affect your longevity. He died at the age of 102. Uh, he says, it gave me an inner joy, an open-mindedness, a gratefulness, open eyes. You notice that grace and gratefulness came up in what the astronauts were talking about as well. Uh, an internal sensitivity for the miracles of creation. I think that in human evolution, it has never been as necessary to have this substance, LSD. It is just a tool to turn us into what we are supposed to be. Um, so actually what's really remarkable about that is not the drug itself, but the idea that it's actually the way that we think about the world around us that can move us into a sustainable future. So sustainability, ecological thinking starts here starts with the way that we approach the world and think about it. And I believe strongly 
that those kinds of ecological modes of thinking are coming to the fore in landscape architecture. So I'd like to recommend to you a nice book. Um, so this is, uh, this is my uh, second edition of my Fundamentals of Landscape Architecture. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that the first edition did very well, particularly in China, where landscape architecture is booming. Um, but uh, uh, so it was translated into seven languages and now is out in uh, a new edition. Um, I'm sorry to say it's not available here. It's just now hitting the, the, the bookshelves. And the Reba Bookshop in London has, a, has copies of it, but it didn't make it here. Uh, but I have this for you to take a look at uh, if you'd like to, to chat with me afterwards and, and leaf through it. You're, you're more than welcome. Um, so the book covers some history. There's a little bit at the beginning talking about how at Skara Bray, uh, 3,000 years BC, um, people were already living. I mean, here's a hearth. So you can see that there are, are patterns of engagement with the land, our patterns of dwelling, um, actually, and in very ecological ways here, had already come to pass. Um, we tend to think of standing stones as just stones, but actually it's a landscape. And I love this picture because it kind of shows that, that, that this is something. A landscape is a place that shapes us and which we in return shape. So it's about a dialogue between people and place. And I think you can see that dialogue in very early inhabitation of the British Isles there as well. Uh, fast forwarding. Uh, famous landscape architect, Andre Le Nocher, uh, just, just leaping a couple of millennia. Uh, it's, it's no big deal. Um, so here's an idea of kind of human dominion over the earth. Now, this is the dead opposite of where I think landscape architecture ought to be going. Um, it's not that we have charge of the universe around us and we have to make it in our image. It has to make us too. So scratch that. Um, is it perhaps Capability Brown? Is he the next uh, you know, big thing? This is a little bit more organic. It's curvy. Um, but, uh, but actually, this is still kind of an expression of, of the wealth of white guys um, and maybe could be more uh, ecological yet. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted. Here's a people's park. So this is Central Park. Um, all of these things feature in the book, but you know, here's a great. Here's where the idea of the great green lung really comes from. And contemporary landscape architecture. Um, this is Gardens by the Bay in Singapore, trying to be an exemplar for certain types of plantings. So these, what are called super trees, there's all sorts of cooling systems associated with them. They're lighted at night. You can climb up them. They they have bromeliads and epiphytes. Uh, dripping off of them. So, so this is an attempt to think about what an ecological park for the future might possibly look like. Um, and it's, it's great because it looks like the future, doesn't it? This is, this is just a little bit of sci-fi. So when you come back from your acid trip in outer space, this is waiting for you. So here's a project in Arizona. Uh, this, is, uh, this features in a whole chapter of the book. Um, and this is uh, Christy Ten Eyck. Ten Eyck Landscape Architecture. And I wanted to show this to you because I think it's a, a, a lovely example of how we can reuse and think, reuse materials and think through the landscape for how it can provide cues for us to design with it. Um, so this is in Arizona, so it's a very arid uh, climate. Mesquite trees, um, you've got all the cacti in the arroyo here. Um, it's hard to imagine, but this is a former military airstrip uh, that's been turned into this incredible uh, desert wonderland. Um, and what a wonderful place to study. Um, Christy Tanike does things like she uses the, uh, the condensation from cooling systems for irrigation, um, captures water anywhere and everywhere she can. Um, and this is the, this is the blooms of the wildflowers in the arroyos after a rain, again with the mesquite trees in the background. Oops. Um, this is uh, referring to irrigation systems in that particular area of the world, um, which, which would have led in channels directly to trees. So this is in reference to traditional um, agricultural methods 
in Arizona, but also there's a quote here of the famous Patio de las Naranjas in Sevilla. Uh, so, so there's a little bit of, of landscape architectural memory in there at the same time. Here you can see uh, with the equisetums and such in the foreground, it's a, it's, a, it's a landscape that's occasionally inundated with water during the rains um, and quite lush for a desert landscape. Here's what it looked like beforehand. And here's the concept sketch. This is not high concept. We're not talking about, you know, ah, oh, my design is a nautilus shell and I will make it in the image of, no, this is actually thinking, how does water run through this site? Where do people need to go? And how do I make it beautiful? So it went from that to those images you saw before, based upon a simple diagram of how the water is going to move through the, through the site. And here's the construction. Uh, one thing I wanted to note here is that that's all the piping that's required. That's it. All of this is surface level drainage uh, absorbed by the arroyos themselves or held in detention, retention ponds just slightly off of the site. Um, and this is all of the concrete from the airstrips being reused on site. So it's not going anywhere except for right back into the site to make these beautiful retaining walls. So it has a kind of rough and tumble desert look about it that, that, that is actually highly ecological. Um, and then this is the site as it matures. Um, a great place, I think, to learn because not only are you getting your book learning, but you have a landscape that reveals natural processes to you as you walk through it. So a really delightful landscape. And that forms a whole chapter of the book. Just very quickly, you know, you need to have some inspiring imagery to, to, um, to end up with here. So some, some more pretty pictures. There are some gardens in the book. Uh, one of them that features is Cal Perrault's um, Jardin des Esperides, uh, which was at the Matisse uh, Garden Festival in Canada a few years ago. Beautiful, ethereal landscape scented with orange blossoms and this sort of Vietnamese lantern figure. So uh, I put this in mainly to make the point that beauty and grace are a fundamental element of sustainability. It won't last if it's not beautiful and if you can't love it. So that's, of course, this is for a garden festival that's torn down at the end, but never mind that. Um, Here's James Corner Field Operations. Um, absolutely different here. We're talking about a carnival kind of landscape, which is just a little bit East London and just a little bit, you know, kind of fun. Um, so all sorts of stuff is enabled in this landscape, along with a vast range of sustainable drainage, water-sensitive urban design. I mean, this is a really wonderful example of, I think, which, what is actually a very traditional English park. It's an English park studded with follies, some uh, better than others. Um, so so it's, it's really also referencing history. You need a little bit of history to be sustainable as well, I think. Um, and then this is Thomas Balsley Associates. Um, Hunter's Point Park, uh, which also features in the book uh, in New York City, part of really beautiful work that's going in all along all the banks of the river in, in New York City. So uh, two sort of lovely images to end on. That's, that, that's my conclusion image for the, for, for the book. It's, it's a kind of nice twilight, uh, boating off into the sunset kind of image. <laughs> Um, right, so uh, if, if anyone would like to talk to me uh, about the book or have a look through it, I'm more than happy to, to, to have a chat afterwards. Thank you.